Romans chapter 8, and I'd like some comments on this, and I don't, <clears throat> I never plan to go long, just so you know that. <laughs> but I never plan to go. So that's not, you shouldn't laugh at that because you see the tenderness of my heart to go short for your sake, but the Holy Spirit feel, feels y'all need a little more. <laughs> okay, Romans 8 and verse uh, 28 and 29. <clears throat> and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did, you got any more of those back there? <laughs> did predestinate, bless you, bless you, bless you. Oh, that's just weird. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I was thinking about this scripture, <clears throat> um, particularly the, the, the all things part. The all things, all things work together for good. And, um, <clears throat> and I, saw, I saw sort of a passive thing that can happen with believers where they just, you know, Assume everything's just going to work together for good because they love God. And they're called according to his purpose. So <clears throat> it would appear if that was the case, then the thing that would be important here would be that we have faith that this is true with no participation. I mean, absolutely, it's necessary to have faith, isn't it? But... There is a participation here because the goal is to be conformed to the image of his son. The goal is to be conformed to the image of his son. And that is the purpose. Those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's the purpose. So the purpose, um, the purpose uh, requires involvement, <clears throat> uh, the, I would say the first involvement that it requires is number one that we uh, we understand that there is a purpose and that that purpose is uh, not just to be a Christian not just to go to church not just to read our Bibles not just to do all of the, the normal things that we call Christian. <clears throat> because this isn't talking about being conformed to a Christian or Christianity. It's talking about being conformed to God's Son. The Son of God. Which I would say is a tall order if we see it a certain, in a certain light. It's not so much a tall order if we see it in another light. But, it, but the emphasis being on God's Son in that manner is that we see the, we see the importance of the purpose. We see it. We see that it, it has to do with us in relationship to God's Son. And again, put just slightly different way, that relationship isn't just to believe that there is a God or that to believe that God has a son or to believe that God started a religion, which <clears throat> I don't think he did. I think he just came and is sure in the heart of the Father and <clears throat> manifesting the, the true nature of God and that we seek him, not, not his teaching. I know that sounds weird, but we seek him. I mean, my 
Wallace quoted it a couple of times this morning, John 5, 39. Search the scriptures for they are they which testify of me. And so it is a search, it is a hunger. See, it's, it has to be more than a search. More than a search. There has to be a hunger for that one, for that person, for that son. Okay? Um, then it would also require that there be some sort of a, um, a recognition of the son that it's talking about here. Right? And we know that, that Paul uh, often refers to him as Christ crucified not just in terms of salvation. Um, I, I often think of the story where, where Jesus is walking on the water and Peter says, can I come to you on the water? <clears throat> Jesus says, come. Yes, you can do that. You can come to me on the water, but you can't walk on water. I'm not going to give you the ability to walk on water. I'm going to give you the ability to come to me if that's where your heart is. And I believe it was. I believe, you know, because Peter's words were, can I come to you? See, he wasn't, he wasn't going, oh, I want to do that. You know, he wasn't that childish on that front. I, I want to do that. I want to I wanna see a miracle or I want to do a miracle or I want to, you know, I want to be able to tell everybody what God has done for me. Interestingly enough, it's as if he doesn't think the way a lot of Christians do today. You know, if God does a miracle for you, we have to make a big deal out of it, when in reality, the whole point should be him. That he's, he did the miracle. That it came out of his heart. And so Peter is coming to him, and then he starts looking around at all the impossibilities instead of just coming to Jesus. See? We say, keep your eyes on Jesus, but isn't it more in that story than just keep your eyes on Jesus? Couldn't he just sat in the boat and kept his eyes on Jesus? And just been content. You know, this is, this is what God wants. God just wants us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's sit in the boat. Let's all sit in the boat. But it's a lot more difficult to come to Jesus in the middle of a storm. You know what I'm saying? Our storms, all of our storms, it's a lot more difficult because we, because we have enemies. And it's not the devil swimming under the water, grabbing Peter's feet, trying to pull him under, you know, sticking his soles of his feet with pitchforks. You've never seen that picture, have you? <laughs> and, or, you know, coming by on a jet ski and trying to knock him off course or knock him down into the water. There are enemies in that story, but those enemies are within Peter. And then they're not necessarily, in fact, I don't believe in this case, they have anything to do with demons. How about that? Nothing to do with Satan is my enemy and he's going to do this to me. But rather, it has to do with his own fears of Self, what is it, survival. And, and he begins to sink. And he sinks not because of the impossibility of what he was doing. He sinks because of the stuff that works in him. Now, can we all agree that, that everybody in these other churches is... <laughs> We agree that there are things in us that are keeping us 
here it comes, from being conformed to the image of Christ because those very things are the opposite of Jesus. Jesus gave his life. Jesus lost his life for others. Jesus, you know, and, and here we could say, well, Peter's just trying to save his life and there would be no losing of his life for others, but Jesus would do that, did do that, does do that in his body. You know, his body to him that we call the body of Christ is no different than his body, his physical body, when he walked the earth 2,000 years ago. It's still his body. And he still wants control, but the control he wants is not, I am Lord and I want to control all of the Christians. But y'all are so rebellious. He, it's his body. It is genuinely his body. And he wants the same freedom that he had when he walked the earth. Well, ultimately, he, took, he, he had that body walk to Calvary. Not for himself, but for everyone else. So Peter starts to sink And if you really think about it, it's sort of incredible wording. <clears throat> he says, save me, Lord. He's not talking about salvation like most Christians talk about it. I, yes, I believe in that, and that's all fine. But I think there's a whole lot more saving that we need. <clears throat> we need to be saved from ourselves. We need to be saved from our fears. We need to be saved from the things that, uh, that make us look at problems and give them legitimacy in the face of coming to Jesus. You know? Okay. Save me, Lord, save me. <clears throat> okay. So maybe his wording, maybe his thought was, save me from the deep and save me from the death that I'm, I could die here. But what if he had have prayed, Lord, save me from myself and the things that cause me to quit coming unto you, getting closer. Because, you know, the closer you get to him, the, the more you're going to be conformed to his image, the more you're going to see his face, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And in that being changed. <clears throat> but our prayer so much of the time is save me from this sinking with no thought of save me from me and those things that I've allowed in me that I say are legitimate. And, and, you know, I mean, I'd like to say in the Lord, the Lord wouldn't condemn that. He'd just keep, keep on you, you know, keep with you until you're conformed to his image. <clears throat> but Jesus did say to him, you know, why did you fear? Oh, you know, why did you doubt? Why did you fear? Why did you stop coming to me? Yes, you... You took your eyes off of me, but you left the goal. You left the purpose to be conformed. You, if, if you use that as a picture of being conf coming after the Lord, f going after him so that you might be conformed. <clears throat> and so um, in Romans here, I think that there is a part that we play in this to be, you know, all things working together for good. I, this is just me personally, and you don't have to believe this, but I don't believe all things work together for good just randomly. I believe that a person has to have within them the thing that says, I do want to be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay, that's first. I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. Because that would be absolutely necessary for the next part I'm going to talk about. If that wasn't there, 
it wouldn't be so, so good. I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. <clears throat> the second part of that would be I know the Christ that I want to be conformed to. I know what he's like. I know what he what conformity to him would be. We use the simple things that Jesus used a lot of times in Matthew 5 and 6, which are all, in my opinion, valid. Turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. <clears throat> Just good examples of his nature. That when, when, uh, when we were living in this world, I mean, you know, you know the one of, of go the extra mile was a Roman thing that they would conscript Jews and, and say, you have to walk with me and carry my load or do something for me for a mile. You have to do that. That's the law. You've got to do that. And that's like the law, the, like Moses' law, in the sense that it is required and we 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 feel obligated to do it but in the greater sense that law was unfair to make Jews serve Romans to do that you're making me leave what I'm doing where I was going I was going to the hospital to visit a relative that got hurt or I was you know all the all the things all the all the good reasons for not letting Christ live in us, for not being conformed. Because letting Christ live in us is to be conformed to the image of Christ, to his son. That is, to, to allow those things that are nature to him, but anything that's nature to Jesus rubs against our nature. Is that right or wrong? Man, I mean, it does, because we're, we're selfish by, by nature, by birth. We're selfish by birth. And so... Um, when, when a Roman comes up, and see, we, we, don't, we look at that as some Old Testament story. When somebody comes up and, you know, they may only simply come up and ask you, could you please help with this or unloading that or, <laughs> or moving tiles or something weird. Or someone, you know, some, someone in your home, you know. Um, there is a sense of injustice that says this is wrong. Okay. All right. You're absolutely right according to the law. You're absolutely right. This is wrong. Okay. But you're not under the law. You have a new nature. You're a new creature. <laughs> if any man, woman or child, be in Christ, he is a new creation. And that new creation is this. And it talks about that just above that. About we no longer serve ourselves, but him. We serve him by allowing him to live through us. And so, so when you get to that situation and, you know, I mean, I know we can hear the teaching and I know we can all nod, but the, the goal, the greatest desire and goal would be to somehow take a teaching that comes from a Bible written a long time ago using weird examples and find Jesus in it and, and, and be able to lay the template of what Jesus taught over everyday life. Over everyday life. Okay. So that um, so that all things working together for good only happen when in everything we want to be conformed to the image of Christ. Does that make sense? 
it all doesn't magically work for good and it all doesn't automatically work for good and it all doesn't just randomly happen. It happens when we're in a situation and we say, I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. And I do, I flow with that nature or his spirit or the lamb manifests through me. That's being conformed to the, his image. That is an example of being conformed to his image. Especially the more, uh, and again, to them that love God, and it's talking about love God, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the manner that they operate one another. Jesus doesn't testify of himself, but of the Father. The Holy Spirit came and wouldn't declare himself. He declares the Son, and on and on and on. A spirit of, of um, self-forgetting and being more aware. Um, but see, that all things must become everything. Because if, if you're just living in the flesh and doing something, that's not going to work together for good. Just because there's a scripture that says it all works together, that's not going to do it. If in those situations you, you really could care less whether you conform to the image of Christ, you really don't have a heart for it. Or And I'm not saying anybody here does that. I'm just I'm trying, to, I'm trying to, yeah, that if someone didn't have that, how much hope can they have that all things are going to work? That, that that situation that just went opposite of that and didn't care about it is going to be part of the all things. Let's throw that in the basket too. You say, well, I know that even when I do something wrong, God can use that. He can, but is he using it to conform you to the image of his son? Or is it just another in a long series of a trail of blood behind you where, you know, people are being wounded instead of Healed. I was thinking about justice. What is justice? Justice is when somebody has done you wrong is punished for that. And I was thinking justice to God is when somebody that's done wrong is, is uh, or let's put it this way, someone because something was done wrong is punished and God says, I'll take that. That's the difference. That's God's justice. See, we always... We divide it up and we say, well, there's God's love and there's God's justice. But it's all one. He's one. God is one. And he says, okay, well, my justice is someone has to be punished for that wrong and I'll do it. That's God's justice or God's love or whatever term you want to put on that. That's God. That's the way he is. See? And so... Um, so we're, so we're like Peter, but instead of looking at the waves and looking at the storm, maybe lightning and, you know, hearing thunder or something like that, we're looking at what's wrong. And that's our storm. We're looking at what is unjust, and that's our storm. We're looking at what, uh, you know, is in our minds trying to impede me from coming to Jesus, when in reality... The best way to come to Jesus is to have that spirit, to allow him, you know, to live. I mean, we say, well, Jesus died so I could live. Well, yes. But he didn't die so you could live in the flesh. <laughs> and he didn't, lie, he didn't die so you can live Christian. Or he didn't die so that you could live a really good life. Or he didn't die for, he died that Christ may eventually be formed in you so that you would die that he might live. Because you have that same nature. It's now you're, you're not just saved because he died for you and this is everything because he died and I get the, the, the blessings. But now it's, 
oh my God, he died for me so that I could get everything and I'm living like I'm the center of the universe. And then you find the ability, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, Christ lives within me. And you see that that's a possibility that you could die, that he could live. You could lose, that he could gain. You could become poor, that he could become rich. And you see that. And, and those are examples, too, that Paul used of himself. That same Christ, that same Jesus, that same son. That it was for him, uh, he'd seen the cross, and I'm sure at the beginning he saw the cross and he got saved by it. But eventually he kept looking and looking and realized this, God wants this life in us for the good of others, for the good of satisfying justice. being the one that is punished or whatever for someone else, you know. Paul, you know, we, 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 we've seen the uh, passion of Christ and Paul's, I mean, uh, Jesus is all beat up and bloody. But Paul took quite a few stripes himself. Did you know that? Paul, Paul got beat quite a bit, and it was just for others. It was because he was going there. It was, it was kingdom stripes. He made them kingdom stripes. They could have been just rebellious stripes. They could have been, well, you're just rebelling against the laws of, of the city of Ephesus, and therefore you're getting these stripes. Or it could be kingdom stripes because the king, the nature of Christ lives within him, and he takes them for God and others, and he believes that there's something real about that lamb nature being able to, in him, lay down his life and take stripes or whatever when he didn't deserve them or could have avoided them. I mean, any time, you know, the scriptures, it talks about, what was it, three times he got how many? 39 stripes? He was a Roman citizen. They couldn't do that to him. Do you realize that? Nobody could legally do that to him. All he had to do, and yes, he did at one time, but he did that. He said he wanted to go to Rome, so he went as a prisoner. But they couldn't, they couldn't whip him. They couldn't kill the Son of God. They, could, they didn't murder Jesus. And they didn't whip Paul. Paul bore that by the nature of Christ for all the nations and all the cities and all the people that he went to, believing that this is what Jesus would do. He, and this is what Jesus did, and he wants to still do it. How does it say in the book of Acts? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's... Uh, you know, it's just the beginning. This book of Acts is now the continuation of it. The continuation of us allowing him to live in his body. The continuation of allowing him to breathe. The continuation of allowing him to move when he wants to move. The continuation of allowing him to um, give and the joy, see, it's more blessed to give than receive. Well, you know, anybody ever at any point in your walk have a hard time with that scripture? You know, it's more blessed to give than receive. No, it's not. You know, I mean, y'all heard me. I changed it to it's more blessed. It's better. What was it? It's it's better to have gifts than receipts. <laughs> Well, for him, it really is better to give. I mean, it is. It is totally, totally, you know. And so then we read over, you know, and we quote this a lot during the offering, not here, but I've heard it usually in offerings. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Well, get the baskets because God loves a cheerful giver. 
See, see, that's the emphasis is where? On us getting. I'm going to put this in your face so that I can get. You know, and the word cheerful there isn't your normal word for just cheerful. It's hilarious. That's the word. The Lord loves a hilarious gift. Okay, that's a little picture of it's more blessed to give. Jesus is hilarious about it. He loves to give. He loves to, 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 I mean, you know, come boldly to the throne. So we go, yeah, praise God, I'm a son of God. I'm going to come boldly to the throne. And there he's always sits. There he's always ministering to us as we come boldly to that throne. It's always about us getting something. And we don't even think, man, he just gives and gives and gives and gives. And I leave for a month or whatever and never show back up and, you know, coming boldly before the throne of grace. But when I show up, he's still sitting there. So, hey, could you do this and that for me? He goes, yeah, you know. You say, well, he's, he loves to give. I can tell. But it looks like a little sadness in his heart. Is he getting tired of giving? No, he's not getting tired of giving. He'd like for his body to be, to allow him to do that in him, and you know, and to be him, to be a true reflection of him, to be a true manifestation of the one that already is our life. But we have to let him live, or all things, because we allow it in everything. Does that make sense? I need to finish with that. So I need to know if you can. That makes sense. How many of you, it does, and if it doesn't, it's okay. Raise your hand if it does kind of make sense. Y'all just trying to get me to quit. I know you sneaky people. I know you sneaky people. I just think that's beautiful. You see how I close my Bible? That means nothing. <laughs> All things work because in everything, okay, here's a good example, which I told you I wasn't done. All things work together for good because in everything give thanks. See, Scott got that one. That's amazing because that means that all this junk that comes our way and all the storms and all the people that make you go an extra mile and everything, you're supposed to be giving thanks for that. In other words, there really is a, a making all, uh, um, all things work together. You're doing that by in everything going, thank you, Lord. You know, something goes wrong. And, you know, I've used this example, and I, I don't know that it's a very good example. But, you know, we get in a wreck over here, or somebody, you know, we go out and have a flat tire. That's a better one. Go out, we got a flat tire. Go, oh, God, this is just terrible, you know. And, and, uh, but if we didn't have a flat tire, we would have got in the car and drove down the street and another car would have hit us and, you know, paralyzed us or something. We, we don't even think, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Lord, for the flat tire. I don't need to know everything. I just know that if in everything, <laughs> let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight, and thank you for bringing the hunters here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And thank you that your spirit is upon us. The spirit of the Lord is upon us. The spirit of the Lord is here, and he's upon us. And he is wooing us further to, to get out of our boats of comfort, to, to make a perilous journey that seems impossible for one purpose, and that is to come to you, to face waves that people in the boat don't face, and to do it without getting caught up in them because we know the purpose to come unto you and to be conformed unto your image. So let the Spirit of God, Father, be loosed 
and let our hearts be set free from the cages of fears, the cages of lack of understanding, the cages of ignorance that holds us back, the cages of religion. And let us find fresh manna, fresh Christ, fresh sun from heaven that is not earth bound, that is not earth bound and never ultimately was earth bound. And let us, if we are born above, let us walk in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in it. Let us walk it out. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love your cheerful giving. We want you to be free to do that in us. In Jesus' name, amen.